Let's go back in time to 1932 as Converse brings you historic footage of the legendary original Celtics with whom all great professional teams are compared. We have now taken over your radio. Richie Guerin is about to show you the most important step in getting past a man. It's the first one. And Oscar will inbound it. The men in green, the Milwaukee Bucks, that's Al Cinder against Bellamy. Jordan, Allen, Shane, Gray, gets two! Gilmore on a oh! stop! Oh, oh brother! Lead to lead, Artis, you get 21! 4.28 to go in the first quarter for the Cow Palace. Here's Barry. Jordan, open! Chicago with the lead! Hello, and welcome back to the Over and Back Classic NBA Podcast. I am Jason Mann, and we are continuing our Top 50 Project. We're almost at the end, and today we will be discussing Sidney Moncrief, and our guest is Brian Schroeder. Uh, he writes for Harvard Paroxysm, Bulls by the Horns. Welcome back to the show, sir. Thanks for having me back. And um, so just kind of going through the uh, little bit of the overall um, – Numbers and such for Sidney Moncrief. He is 102nd all time in win shares, 28th in win shares per 48, uh, 38, uh, 35th, excuse me, in, in box score plus minus, and 79th in value over placement player. He was a two time defensive player of the year, uh, one time all NBA first team, four times in the second team, uh, four time on the all defensive first team, one time on the second team. He had six seasons where he was in the top 10 in win shares per 48, five seasons in top. 10 in value over placement player. The uh, Bill Simmons uh, Book of Basketball Pyramid has him as uh, 73rd all-time, and the Slam 500 it has him at uh, 90th. He was a excellent two-way guard, a really great perimeter defender, very good score, and a solid passer. And, you know, for me, he had kind of been a uh, blind spot, but it was, you know, great excuse to uh, research him. So uh, what do you think about uh, Sidney Moncrief and his top 50 case? His top 50 case is... I certainly think he's more worthy than uh, guys who might get looks ahead of him simply because they play for the Lakers or the Celtics. I think they can worthy in particular, but I, I, I'm not sure if he like first blush, if he is the top 50 guy, but I do wonder if he should be a hall of fame guy. And I think the answer to, you could answer yes to both. The answer to the latter is absolutely yes. And even if he's not a, for sure a top 50 guy, I think he still warrants conversation because he's just such an interesting and sort of forgotten player when he was one of the best players in basketball for half a decade. And we don't really think about him or have much to say about him anymore. Yeah, I mean, he was. Yeah, he he was almost certainly the best shooting guard in the NBA from about eighty two to eighty six, um, and uh, you know was was a really great efficient shooter. He was uh, great at, at drawing free throws. Um, I really, uh, you know, kind of a lot of the, the strengths that he had are kind of similar to modern point guards, except for he was not much of a three-point shooter. But um, you know, he could get pretty up pretty well. He could take contact well for only being 6'3 and 180. Um, you know, not not big for that position, obviously. Um, and, you know, yeah, I mean, he was up there with, um, with you know, Magic Johnson, Isaiah Thomas as the, you know, the best guards in the game at the time. Um, you know, right before Jordan kind of came into the league and, or, you know, as he was being established. Um, yeah, I would say he's definitely, you know, the best NBA player, not in the hall of fame, he, or, you know, or very close to it. He certainly should be in the hall of fame. Um, it's looking at it here. I have a, I have a table <clears throat> from 1979 to 1991, only six players totaled 3,500 rebounds, 2,700 assists, 200 blocks, 900 steals. Magic Johnson, Larry Bird, Jack Sigma, Alex English, Clyde Drexler, Sidney Moncrief. That's a good list. And he is fourth on that group in win shares. He had yeah. Sigma, Bird, and Giant Magic, obviously. So he, he just was a really prolific player through the 80s, and that's including he kind of fell out of his prime by 86, 87. So he, he really just got hit hard with injuries and just sort of fell away quickly. But, I mean, if he – I don't want to say go as far to say that he, we, were, he was, we were robbed of his career with injuries, but if he'd been I, – I almost want I, – part of me is wondering – if he'd come along at an age when there wasn't the restrictions on college players coming out wasn't weren't so heavy, if he'd come out at age nineteen or twenty instead of twenty two, he could have made seven or eight All Star teams. He made they, they didn't they sweep 
in 84, I think, 83 or 84, they swept the Celtics. Yeah, 83. That yeah. Bucks team. Yes. Um, it's and, a very good basketball team that's just, he's the best player. You know, one of the criteria for Hall of Famers is always, were they the best player on their team? And unequivocally, yes. He's the best player on the third most winningest team of the 80s. Yeah, and they, you know, they went to the finals, uh, or excuse me, the um, Eastern Conference Finals in '83, where they, they you know, they, they ran into the Sixers. '84 and '86, where they ran into the Celtics. All those teams, you know, won championships those years. So, you know, I mean, they they were a very stout team for you know basically the same period in which the Sixers and the Celtics, um, you know, were really strong right before the Pistons took over. You know, I honestly think that if Mon- if you know if the breaks had gone a little differently, if Moncrief had not dealt with the injuries later in his career and had um, um, you know, and if the Bucks had been able to make a finals or two, or at least win one championship, I think we'd think of him the same way we think of Isaiah Thomas. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we have this picture of Isaiah as an all-time, an all-time great player. With I'm not entirely sure it's true, although he's definitely a high-level point guard. But I mean, yeah, I, I, I probably could compare them a little more in depth. But Moncrief was definitely a better defender. Yeah, probably. It's hard, you know. It's always hard to qu- to quantify defense, but he was he won the first two Defensive Player of the Year awards. He's the only guard to ever win it more than once, and he, by everyone's reckoning, is one of the better perimeter defenders of all time. At least by Jordan's reckoning, and that counts for something. Sure, definitely. And you know, he gave Jordan fits early on in Jordan's career. I mean, I, I think the first year that that Jordan made the playoffs, they played the Bucks, and you know, he was. I mean, he still, you know, he's Jordan. He played pretty well, but he was hounded by Moncrief, and you know, the Bucks were obviously a stronger team at the time. Um, yeah, Moncrief, he's one <laughs> of thirteen retired guards to average at least fifteen points, four point five rebounds, yep, and three point five assists per game. Uh, and then ten of those are in the Hall of Fame. The only the only other two who are not are Penny Hardaway and Steve Francis, who are not likely Hall of Famers, but they are guys who did have like four or five really strong years and then yeah. faded because of injuries or or what have you. But I mean, Moncrief was clearly a better player. But, but Penny Hardaway, he was gone. He was gone at thirty three. Moncrief retired at age thirty three. Right, like, and, and he he came back. He was gone. He was out for a couple years, and then he came back in ninety one. Played for the Hawks. Uh, the rest of the, yep. his career was with the Bucks. Um, yeah, I mean, he has. If Kareem weren't there, he would definitely be in the conversation for greatest buck ever. I mean, if you consider the longevity, you could even make a case that you know, if if you want to say, you know, he he did more for the Bucks in his ten years than Kareem did in the five years. It, it's still, you know, Kareem was so great. It's, uh, but he's definitely up there in the greatest player ever for the franchise um, discussion. You know, yeah, he, he's he's definitely one or two. Um, uh, Rich did some uh, did some sort of advanced uh, numbers. He looked at uh, comparisons to Aaron position. He was fourth in win shares, fourth in win shares for 48, and fourth in value replacement player, basically uh, behind uh, Magic, uh, Michael, and uh, Clyde Drexler. Uh, looking at rating his position all time, he is 34th in win shares, 9th in win shares for 48, 29th in value of replacement player. I did a, a planned deck search kind of comparing him to uh, Dwayne Wade at roughly the, kind of the same point in their careers. Yeah. And you, it is pretty, like, it, it's very similar. The advanced stats, like win shares are almost exactly the same. Win shares are 48. Moncrief is actually slightly better. Um, you know, the uh, the, the value of replacement um Wade is stronger because the the box show plus minus likes Wade a bit better, but the wind shares like Moncrief. Um, and uh, Wade was a, a much higher usage player. Moncrief was was uh, you know he was a good uh, um, yeah he was like twenty one point three usage from like his you know kind of his eight peak years where uh, Wade was you know kind of close to thirty two. So, uh, but they had similar turnover rates. Um, I, the thing that, that Moncrief surprised me a little bit, and he was more, he did play some point guard throughout his career, but I guess you know, he more toward the shooting guard was that his um, his assist numbers were pretty low for, uh, yeah, I, I just kind of would have expected, I'm not sure why I would have expected. I think part of that might be, might be Pressy's. Um, That's true. Yeah. Just, he, he played that role, you know, the point forward role. He kind of, you know, popularized that um, during the, during yeah. the time with the Bucks, And, you know, maybe, maybe just the Don Nelson style wasn't, um, you know, quite suited for that, for, um, for Moncrief to do that. I mean, you know, I, I think he was great in every, every other respect pretty much. Um, but yeah, it wasn't quite uh, there. One of the most efficient scores of the early eighties easily. I mean. Yeah. Just high level, high level by every, by pretty much every statistical measure. Uh, interestingly, from eighty one to eighty six, he had a higher offensive win, sh- higher win shares, and win shares for forty eight all around than Magic Johnson, right. who was 
for the first one of the two best basketball players alive at that point. Yeah. So I, I mean, yeah, for three, three if you want to count Jordan. Um, well, eighty one. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I'm I guess sure. depending on your, your point of view on on that, but yeah, a little revision. I, I, I get I get what you I get what you're saying. Top three guy in eighty five. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um. So well, he probably was. <laughs> yeah. Um. Either way, he's definitely was in that conversation and and is not thought of that way t- today at all. I mean, he's not even in the Hall of Fame, which is it, it was really ridiculous. He's not in the Hall of Fame. I mean, granted, yeah, his, his peak was not. You know, he he had that five year peak, but you know, he's way better. You know, he's, I mean, he's a stronger candidate than, you know, Pete Maravich, who, you know, who was a very good player and, and very important player. And, you know, it has the college play as well. Um, I mean, Moncrief was a good college player, but nothing, you know, not like Maravich was. So, I mean, th- there are certainly guys who had short careers who are in the hall of fame. It's just kind of ridiculous that it, for a T you know, it, and it wasn't like Moncrief was toiling on, you know, bad teams. I mean, the bucks were, you know, pretty much a contender for, you know, almost his entire time there. Um, so yeah, I, I, I do think that the lack of longevity probably prevents him from really being a top 50 player, but yeah. he definitely belongs. It's good to discuss him. He's good to think about him. I, I guess the only thing that you could say, like, it depends on how much you value his defense or you, you consider that defensive reputation. And if you consider him like, you know, like uh, they were a top, they were a top defensive team. And during his tenure, it's is that due to him, or is it just due to the team? I, yeah, it's always hard to to really differentiate those things. Yeah, I, it is it is hard to determine. I mean, you you, you kind of have to go by reputation to a certain extent. You know, metrics will tell you some things, but you know, it, it's yeah. it's hard to. There's noise there, obviously. Um, so, I mean, if you are willing to, if you come to the conclusion that he is, you know, maybe the, you know, one, one of the greatest uh, guard defenders of all time, then, you know, okay, then maybe that that's a conversation where you can kind of talk yourself into a top 50 case. Other than that, yeah, I just think he's just... I think he has a case for sure. Yeah, I think he's probably just behind too many guys. An interesting question is, I'm not sure of the answer, is he really worse than Clyde Drexler or is it just do we remember Drexler more because of his battles with Jordan? Well, I, I mean, I think, I think, he, I think Drexler might be better, but I'm not entirely ready to commit either way. Honestly, I'm not sure peak Drexler was better, but I think Drexler was probably because of the a longer and more successful career. Yeah. Sure. That, that, that's what I would say. Um, yeah, I, I, you, you put them head to head at their peak. Then yeah, I, I, I'm not sure who's better. Um, I, I, you know, I, I think you could probably. I mean, Drexler was really good too, and Drexler did a lot of different things. Um, uh, you know, um, I mean, I mean, he he was a you know, very good rebounder, very good passer. I mean, just kind of everything. Um, you know, but Squid had just looking here. Squid had a six ninety seven true shooting in, in the eighty four eighty five playoffs. In the eighty five playoffs, yeah. yeah, that by far probably by far led the league to a point to two seventeen win shows for forty eight. Yeah, I mean, he, he was great. Yeah, I'm, I, I, you know, I, I that, that's a hard one. I, I hadn't thought of that one in particular, but I would say, yeah, most likely probably because, I mean, they kind of similar situations too, because Drexler was on, you know, those really good Portland teams. Now they did make the finals, um, but they, you know, had kind of, they sort of toiled in obscurity a little bit because, you know, they were, um, you know, kind of in the shadow of some better remembered teams, you know, in, yep. in, in the West and, and such, even though they did make two finals. But, um, uh, yeah, I mean, that, that's that's an interesting idea. But I do think, uh, yeah, I would say Drexler because of the longevity. Uh, but yeah. I don't know, the, the, the similarities to Wade surprised me, uh, at least the, you know, the um, statistical similarity. I mean, there's some similarities, I guess, in the way they played, too. But, um, but they're, they're shooting guards, high scoring, high, highly efficient shooting guards who didn't really rely on three pointers in their time. Yeah, yeah, and, and and had some point guard traits. But other than that, Wade was more explosive. Right. Sid's a mid range player. Primarily. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I, I do. I mean, you, know, you saw some highlights of of you know of Sid getting up and. Oh, he, he was explosive. He yeah. always plays. There aren't as many highlights of him as you'd assume for a five time All Star. Right. Yeah, he he always played like he looked. He I always played like he. You think he was six six or six seven the way he ran around, right? And his wingspan was probably I don't know the exact numbers, but I imagine it was substantial. Yeah, I, uh, I mean, yeah, I mean, so I, he did show a little bit, but yeah, it's not obviously not compared to Wade. I mean, that that's not even no. in the same league, and then and part of that obviously is the time he played and all that, but, um, but yeah, I, 
I, I I'm glad we got a chance to talk about him. I mean, he's definitely, uh, and you know, he's definitely worth consideration. But um, for what it's worth, he also has one of the better nicknames, sets of nicknames in the history of the NBA. Squid, the Squid, or El Cid, both fantastic. He had a really good mustache too. Yeah, if you're uh, a good mustache is definitely going to uh, is, is definitely going to you know give you a little bit in my book for sure. You know, any good facial hair, any 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 good hair in general, you know, any any way you can distinguish yourself, I, I feel like uh, you know it, it helps to be more memorable. Well, he had massive free throw rates. I didn't. I just noticed yeah, that. Right, really, yeah, massive free throw rates. Right. Um. So I mean, he kind of six hundred and eighty six. Yeah, I mean, he he you know he kind of he definitely he worked his way in there for sure. Yeah, this is an interesting player, and one that I'm kind of realizing is a bit of an archetype. The sort of player I like the most. I mean, Pippen's my favorite player of all time. Mm-hmm. And Pippen's a different, you know, positionally he's a different player, but similar stylistically, I guess. Can handle the ball a little bit, defend, get to the rack, shoot when needed to, but not based on. That's sort of my kind of my archetype for the player I like. I mean, uh, that's why I'm so infatuated with Giannis because that's what he could be. Mm-hmm. So he's really becoming a transition threat, a one-on-one defender, ball handler, rebounder, sort of a Swiss Army knife kind of thing. Yeah, like those of the world, do everything kind of player. You know, and, and you know, it's, unlike some of those players, Moncrief did some things you know extremely, extremely well. You know, I mean, he could do basically everything, but I mean, he yeah. did. Um, you know, but but he did three or four things that were extremely well, and you know, obviously was uh, was a star for sure. So yeah, I, I wish there was more on on you know more video readily accessible. Uh, you know, there's some there's some Buck stuff, but there's not much that focuses specifically on him and his strengths and skills. And you know, I, I yeah. like I obviously like complete footage of um, games and such, but you know, it's also nice to kind of be able to sort of pare down a little bit. And then there's there's a few things, but it's not uh, you know it, it's not as extensive as I would like it to be. But you know, that's, no. that's the internet. You know, you don't always don't always get what you want. It has everything in the world until it doesn't. <laughs> exactly. And interesting, something interesting to think about with Sid is if uh, if he was on Dennis Johnson's place on the Celtics, he would absolutely be a Hall of Famer. Dennis Johnson is, and Sid is a better player in pretty much every respect. So. Yeah, and, and Dennis Johnson sort of the way sort of the way we view. I don't want to Lakers and Celtics, but it is sort of the way we view the Lakers and Celtics that. So. Their players just have a higher profile, especially in the '80s. They always all would have. I mean, I, I imagine a, a significant amount of people who would think that like Michael Cooper is better than Sidney Moncrief because he was on the Lakers, and Michael Cooper was good. But you know, it's just not true. Yeah, for sure. Um, you know, he. Um, I mean, that's, that's an interesting point because yeah, because Dennis Johnson was you know what he was kind of more of a star early on in his career and you know and kind of um you played his way out of places and then eventually kind of accepted the role player um you know thing i i don't know how you know as Moncrief as the injuries mounted up if Moncrief was you know going to be able to kind of be that player or if um you know just the injuries would prevent from him from you know being anything um as a player what were his usages this last few years let me look at his usages i know there was i know they took a fell i know they weren't very high in Atlanta he didn't play yeah, there. and he, um, he only played a thousand minutes in Atlanta in seventy-two games. So um, his usage, yeah, right after his last All Star season, never hit twenty again. So it was twenty plus in all his All Star seasons. He, he scored twenty plus a game. He had one hundred and twenty, almost one hundred and twenty offense rating, and then it just fell off. It's just injuries. Yeah, and it was yeah, it was eighty-seven where he played thirty-nine games, and um, he was still above average, but uh, you know clearly dipped down. And you know, he, I, get, I mean, even those three, the last three years in Milwaukee, eighty-seven, eighty-eight, and eighty-nine, you know, he still maintained. Um, you know, he was above average player, but he clearly was not elite anymore. And you know, yeah. the, the usage dipped. Um, you know, he wasn't uh, he wasn't quite getting to the line as much. Um, I mean, he, he was still shooting and everything. Um, you know, I don't know how the defense was at that point. If that, yeah, we, you would imagine athleticism that could have slipped, but yeah, in most of that, he's just, playing twenty five minutes a game this year. So yeah, something was wrong, right? So uh, you have to wonder how a player like that would respond to today's training regimens, too. I mean, it's a, it's a cop out to say that, but maybe he would have. Maybe if he'd come in at age nineteen or twenty. And Bannon had better medical. I mean, we we have better medical care now for athletes. It's just true. Sure. It's just true. Better surgery is easier to do, easier to recover from. And Rose breaks his face. He's out two weeks. 15, 20 years ago, he might be out a month. You know, 
Maybe maybe Sid could have played into his later thirties and been a, role, a good role player somewhere else and gotten the recognition he deserves because he was very good. Yeah, yeah. Let's see. The the breaks don't always go for uh, for all of us. Oh. Uh, anything else? No, not, not particularly. One thirty seven O rating and won the playoffs. Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> good good stuff. Um, so, uh, thanks everyone for, uh, uh, checking us out. Thanks Brian for, uh, listening. Of course you can uh, find us at harborparoxysm.com and we are part of the HP network of podcasts, which you can, uh, you can find both our feed and that feed on iTunes. We would appreciate a rating and review. We also have a forums on, uh, over and back NBA.com where you can uh, take part in the conversation about any of these players we've talked about or really any subject pertaining to basketball history that you would like. Um, and uh, you find us on Facebook and Twitter at Over and Back NBA. And uh, that's about it. Until next time, uh, thanks for listening, and we'll be back again soon. Mm-hmm.